Welcome to Real Life Guitars on a Saturday evening. Late summer, heat wave again. Mrs. Reloved is over there making a lamp. Um, a rare visit to the workshop. I didn't even tell I tidied up specially for her. <laughs> um, not. So it's an absolute pigsty in here. But anyway, uh, it's been a busy weekend and I'm um, on to this special beauty. This is Bill's Hamer. And Bill, or Billy Bones, as he was known in our house. Bill is a, an old family friend from Coventry. And Bill um, was my dad's physio for quite some time, helping him out, getting his post-stroke bones moving. And this is Bill's Hamer. And Hamers were, a, well, I first saw them in the 80s when we were school kids and we wanted to move on from our plywood nastiness that we learned on, our satellites and such like. And the Hamers were uh, some of the first guitars we saw in Coventry music at the time. Used to kind of, we used to dream about them. But they, they looked incredibly metal-ish um, to us because they were solid-bodied things. Um, most of them were the double-cut ones, I seem to remember. But they, al they also came, they were also, a lot of them were flat slab-shaped bodies and they had very, bi very bright and vibrant colours. And they seemed really sort of modern and American. But this one is, uh, this has got more of a sort of, you know, a sculpted look about it. So this is in for a setup, and I've got a Tusk adjustable nut. Uh, okay, I've just got a message in, can I zoom at eight tonight? I might be able to, yes. Okay, um, yeah, so this is, there's a Tusk adjustable nut we're going to fit to this. Um, this has got a plastic nut, and it's had a nut repair in the past, so it will help to have this Tusk unit here, which will... Um, help the tuning stability. Uh, I can see where Bill has done some homemade um, markings on the side there. I, I was wondering if I could tidy those up, but it, I'm not quite sure how what's underneath those little marks. And I'm sure they work just as perfectly fine as intended, so I won't touch them. Um, this has been played a lot, so the frets are fairly low. Um, and there are a couple of notes that are slightly dead um, which I'm going to level out incredibly lightly to see if we can make sure that everything plays nicely. Um, but it's going to be a very light leveling job. I, I would say these are two thirds of their life done, and just uh, you know, would be next in next step on the way for in my book would be a refret for these. And it's just through age and play, and that's a good sign really that the guitar's liked well enough. So it's fairly conventional. Um, I know that Bill's fitted a uh, DiMarzio recently with uh, some switching that I'm, I can't pretend to understand because it does weird things. So I'm not really going to address that. I presume that that's Bill's territory and he's got the settings the way he wants it. Um, so we're going to do a good old fashioned setup. Um, Claire's going to be making things and making noise in the background. So Bill, I hope you don't mind. Um, one of the things I noticed, I uh, just want to say before I get going, one of the things, Bill, I noticed was that even with these old, not old strings, these are fairly new, aren't they? I noticed that the um, there was tons of slack still in the strings. So one of the things I talk about a lot is tuning stability on your guitar uh, is down to two factors. The first one is the nut that you use and the material and the condition of the slots and we take care of that by making sure it's a tusk nut first and foremost but also um, making it adjustable and making the, sure that the slots are factory cut ideally um, and the second half of the equation is the amount of unreleased slack in the strings and one of the things I'll do when I put the new strings on at the end of this is I'm going to go through the sort of routine that I do to get all of the slack out before I start playing a guitar. And that way I know that I can put it on the peg and just get it straight down and play. And you know, if you're playing with, I know Bill, you play with other people, so it will be, it will save you an awful lot of um, adjustment and stuff when you're playing with people, because that can be a real panic when you have to whiz through the tuning settings. Anyway, so the first thing I will do, um, I guess I will sort of I talk my way through as if you hadn't seen my kind of stuff. Um, so that what I do with this is I'm going to uh, replace the nut first. I'm going to I'm just go I've been playing this for a couple of hours so I know how well it plays and it's actually 
it's actually uh, overall a very nice player thanks to its well played in low frets but i'm going to um i'm going to take off replace the nut the relief in the neck is actually um just about spot on as it is so we don't need to adjust that um, and then i'm going to fit the new nut and sand it and adjust it exactly to shape uh, and once that's on then i will get into the fret leveling part and the fret leveling uh, is a good way for me to tell what's going on with the neck now there were some spots that bill was saying sounded dead um, by comparison to other areas so I, I will i'm only putting this on in case I, we need to make any adjustments but i'm i'm also sorry i'm also taking it off partly because getting the nut off helps to um, remove the truss rod cover so I'm, the first thing i'm going to do is just slack the strings off so i can get access to the nut um, uh, keep checking with the mirror see what you can see um, this is i can see that bill's done a a uh, super glue and something or other repair on here which is um, obviously worked okay now one of the things i want to just double check and make sure this isn't so well sealed in a nut that it's going to cause any issues with the finish it is quite deeply set in here so i'm going to give it a tap um, but i'll be watching out for whether it comes away quickly and easily or whether it's uh, going to put up a major fight and actually at this point in time it's kind of moving but it may put up a fight uh, it's as i say it's fairly deeply into that slot so one of the things i don't know if you see off camera one of the things they can do is just put a, uh, a screwdriver under there into the um, truss rod adjuster cavity and try and move it out uh, so it's not budging just yet in a situation where it doesn't move the next step I go to and this is quite a dramatic thing and I get a lot of comments from people who say you mustn't do that or you get I people to tell me I've scared the life out of them to get this out you can cut you need to cut it out and some people think you should only cut it out with a uh, razor saw or something like that actually I like to use a Dremel cutter because it's quicker and it does the job but it does certainly freak a bunch of people out so this I would consider this plastic nut is destined to go I don't like how deep it is set into there so I'm not going to tap it anymore because what I don't want to do is bust off any of this finish here so I will resort to the Dremel yeah definitely turn off now if you're easily shocked because i you know i have people say oh my god you, you know, how, how can you possibly go towards an electric guitar with a dremel and the answer is if you've got a steady hand and you know what you're doing that's fine um so that's the answer now i've also got to while i'm doing this i've got to change over this chuck thing because i had a specially small one in yesterday for other purposes so what do i need in here what am i looking for oh the other chuck do i know which one it was mm, possibly not was it this one it could have been i think so big stevie gave me this proxon green tool years ago so he had a spare one in his shed and he sent it down to me and I've been using it ever since. I'm very grateful for it too. Sure, it's not called Dremel, but who cares? Yeah, it means, means she gets her Dremel back. Right, so I'm geared up. Now here's the scary, not the scary at all. The only risk in doing it this way, by the way, is that when you get down to the bottom of the nut, there's a very slight risk that you score very likely score the nut shelf or if it's a strat style guitar the nut slot um, and since it only ever scores it it's not a big deal so i'm going to put a disclaimer warning on now noise alert ready everyone hands held steady 
Ready for some dust. Yes, yes, a mask might have been good, but yeah, well, it's only poisonous plastic dust. So eventually, when I get through, we will uh, end up being able to prise this off, sort of. difficulty of course is that you can't approach it straight down so it cuts at a slight slant no matter what you're doing <coughs> or how careful you are so now what I'm looking for is to see a little bit of this snap off it's starting to come apart a, bit, a bit of that came off but not enough because I'm not right down to the bottom of course you know if you've got all the time in the world you can Get your little razor saw in there and keep on going. Uh, to be honest, it's not much easier or harder to see when you've bottomed out on this razor saw uh, than when you're using um, the Dremel. So, so at the moment, it's still quite firmly fixed. I've got a bit more down on this side to go. It's a quieter version, but also it's a much finer blade and it tends to end up getting bound up in the slot, so it can be a pain to use after a while. Um, we're quite a way off still. So sometimes I use the fret grabbers to squeeze the two parts together, but it's a sloping nut. So it's, oh, well that's kind of helping. There's a chunk of it. So, again, that's it's pretty well glued in. So, um, I'll come, I'll carry on down a bit with the Dremel just to get to the very bottom. Because until we can split the two parts out, we aren't going to get any movement out of it. down into the corner there so it could be that a little tap in this direction now will do the trick yeah, just about there we go it's still quite tightly fitted but it will it will come loose now it will come loose now I tell you there we go that's good now we can just chip out the, the rest of it yeah so it's a good old Looks like a good old plastic, hard plastic nut, but it's come away cleanly. So that's the end of the Dremel work for now. <coughs> and now all we, all we have to do is get the blade and just persuade this bit to come out, which it's quite happy to do. There we go. And there's probably some glue on the front face. Actually it's not too bad. It all looks pretty clean. So once you've got the old nut out, can you see? Yeah. You can just check the bottom of the slot by giving it a sort of clean with a file such as this. That just helps to level it out. Then we've got a fit test and that's not far off. And the idea is once we've fitted this adjustable nut, we want the strings to go back on uh, and sit flush with the, on the first fret. 
So the, the thickness there is too great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by just <coughs> gently trimming down the front edge of this nut because we want it flush anyway. So that helps me to get rid of a small amount of the material, but it also then slightly thins the nut down. It makes it look a little bit dirtier to begin with, but I can live with that. So I'm just sanding down the flush face, or the front edge, I should say. Once we've got that flush, nearly. Hmm? Yeah, and that's the mixing desk. I was gonna, yeah, it's okay, I was gonna put some music on. But now we're doing the setup we can't do with copyright strikes. There we are, we're almost, almost straight in. I said getting it too tightly in. So what I'm now gonna do is do a little tiny bit of thinning on the back as well. And then clean up on both sides. I say clean up, it makes it a little bit cleaner. And <coughs> Sometimes if you, it takes getting a, a completely fresh piece of sandpaper out to clean it up. There you go, that fits in beautifully. <coughs> Excuse me. So, how well you can see that. So the first thing I'll do is just check out the height of it and if it's high enough sorry low enough onto the frets then we're good if it's still standing a bit high then i'll take a little bit of height down off the nut the base of it it's a little bit over width which we can send down a tiny bit anyway on that so let me just start by tightening this into place and it, putting the pressure on the strings will ensure that they seat the nut as properly as it can go Okay, so the, up, the higher strings are pretty much touching the uh, frets. I think, we're, I think we don't need to thin it down. We're, we're sort of there, because at this point now, I'd want to make a small adjustment on the height adjustability now, which is there, and we go from there. That's it, lift it up. Okay. It's out of tune, obviously. So what I'm going to do next is two things. I'm going to slack this off again, and I'm going to put a tiny piece of brass material into the nut, which I like to do as a footing to ensure, or to give the, the grub screws a little bit of extra thing to land on. And what I've done with the grub screws is I've flattened them off anyway. Uh, as you can see. What's that? No, I don't actually. Um, I flatten them off so that they spread the load, but what I'll also do is I'll put a little bit of brass in. Hang on a second. What? This is. Oh, that's very kind of you. No, all right, you don't know where to begin, nor do I, and that's the end of the story. Um, just a th question Have you. Do you think it might be soon to be time to check the stickiness of that thing we just made. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, to, do, does it feel solid where it... It's still a bit tacky. Tacky. Yeah, yeah. okay. I think you, you feel inclined to leave it a little bit. Mm. Very well. Trust your instincts. No, you're right. If you could be right if it's if it's tacky. Leave it. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this little bit of wire. No wire, not wire. The other stuff. Oh. Christ! <laughs> I mean, I'm not throwing things at things. Sorry. Heavens above. It all came to pieces in my hands. Anyone tell me what record that's off? Uh, it all came to pieces in my hands. Okay, I'll give you a punk hat, punk vibe. Now, I've, if 
forgotten which side is the front edge of this damn thing. It's magazine from the album Second Hand Daylight. You don't really don't need to try and tidy up. You're just you're just I'm making just, it look worse. I'm just trying to see if anything I can understand. Guys, gentlemen. <laughs> Is your wife fighting a losing battle too? <laughs> like mine is. <coughs> I'm going to. Yes, true, true, true. Possibly true. All came to pieces in her hands. Second Hand Daylight magazine, brilliant album. Do you know my guilty secret is when I'm not on camera here. Do you know what I watch on <laughs> on my um, on the phone? On I watch and sort of mostly listen to 70s sitcoms. I've been I've been in stuck in um, Robin's Nest mode for a while. <coughs> Chrissy, oh Robin, Chrissy, and what the other one? Oh God, I've forgotten. Anyway. Next thing I'm going to do, before I put this nut back on, I'm going to mark up the frets, ready for the levelling. Um, and, yes, I've, I, I've, I even watched a few 1970s uh, <laughs> Coronation Streets. And I never liked Coronation Street. Um, I don't know, I, felt, I hate to say this, you're going to lose friends now and lose friends fast but Coronation Street was too northern for me northern frightened me I know it frightened me uh, yeah but I didn't I, a I didn't really come from Coventry and B it, B it was northern um, Coventry yeah exactly we had one bad weekend somewhere near Leeds and I never never go over it Pies and pies and leads. And rain. And rain. Lots of rain. Yes. Anyway, um, so I was never, I was never very comfortable up north. Um, I'm ashamed to admit. So. Um, and that's because. Ina Sharples. Ina Sharples. There you go. Even that name makes me feel. Odd. Anyway, so I never liked Coronation Street, um, and everyone else was. All, all the kids were into it. So. Good for her. Yes, Snobs. Uh, she wasn't really, but... Much. No, she wasn't. She was mad. Oh, shit. Trick, but she wasn't this doesn't help. Right. Mad and eccentric, but not a snob. Yeah. All right. That makes it all right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to dial up... My culture. Dial up the action I want it to play at now. I'm going to set the playing action. I'm going to tune it now. think anyone would think that I would be explaining to Claire all the ins and outs of this fabulous business. I mean she's seen it and heard it all before. Yes, It'd be like a buzzman's holiday. Yes, you, as long as you did the <laughs> endless lev fret levelings and setups and stuff. Yeah, you would. You'd keep it spot. That would wouldn't be a bad thing to help me with. 
keeping this place spotless. You not really seriously complaining, are you? Much? No. No, no. Okay, I am ready to level. Here we go. Boink. Now, remember, fret's very low to begin with. Um, only a small area of slightly dead notes. The action is set pretty low. I dialed it where I wanted it the other day, so I've set it pretty low anyway. Um, so now I'm just doing the sort of initial leveling on the E track, as I call it. Very little material actually being removed. But what it's good for is it tells me the state of affair, affairs on the neck itself. So it's a sort of good diagnostic. And I can tell straight away, cutting evenly all the way up here, we've got a low spot of about six or seven frets here. Um, and that's a sort of, that's just a, a hillock or a, a thing in the neck. That will be causing those notes to slightly choke out or be slightly deader because the, when you fret in a ditch, it means the next fret, even though it's probably normal height, it actually, its effect is that it makes it high. It's not that bad, but it's it's that's it'll tell you. Oops, that area here where where the tool is not touching the frets at all. That's a low spot. Now sometimes, like as with this one, it can be below the level of the playing action. So oops, oh, I'm sorry you couldn't see any of that. Oh, I'm so crap. I'll show you again. Low low area here. Um, the, the amount of lowness can be below the um, playing action that we've set. So in, the, in fact, it doesn't cause any major problems, but it can cause a problem when it comes to bending the notes. So it, it could be that those slightly low frets there result in high E bends choking out uh, slightly. And I'm just gonna, I'm just giving it a little bit of extra push to see where it touches these. And it's actually not that bad. I would stop there as far as the leveling is concerned. And there's remarkably low action on this. Let's just double check it. Probably lower than it ought to be. I'm always guilty of doing that. Yeah, I've got it barely over one. And this one's a bit fractionally low. You can tell how much, how well loved this guitar is because the edge of the bridge is actually physically worn away. So this is about 1.3 mils, so that's still a low setting. Um, so I can hear that what I call a little zizzing up here because of that low spot. Well, it's not a low spot, it's a low area. So the thing about the neck is you get individual high and low frets, um, which can in interfere with either the playing of an individual note or bends that come across that particular high fret or bends that start on that low fret, which makes the next one high. But actually more common than that is the fact that the neck is generally like that and has different number and amount of ups and downs depending on the neck. And those are exaggerated or those become noticeable when the neck is compressed by the strings pulling it. So you may not have those ups and down humps when its strings are off. Actually, you probably still do, but they're certainly evident when the, the strings are on under load, the neck is under load and it's compressed. So you get these ups and downs. I call them the hills and valleys. And the problem with the hills and valleys, and I'll just um, kind of show you what I mean, if you're interested, Bill. The hills and valleys, we... You know, we have an imaginary, uh, we think of our neck as a kind of nice smooth thing, when in fact, it's the fret leveling process reveals that it's actually sort of more like this, up, down a bit, up a bit, down a bit, fire. up, <laughs> fire, down is a bolt. So, so you could still say overall it describes a curve, but it's bumpier than we think. And so what I... My, my method of fret leveling is about is that 
I calibrate in three different parts of this thing, we take an average and we actually get a kind of smooth curve in this beam. That's a very bad representation, but you can see it's smoother than the hill thing. And then when we bring it down onto the hill and valleys, what we do is we sort of chop off that little bit off there. We miss that bit, obviously. We chop off a little bit on there, and we chop off a little bit on there. And in doing so, we create that little extra space for the strings to move in. And so where they were sometimes rattling before, or slapping, as I call it, um, the, the method I use just gently evens out or smooths out that bumpy fingerboard. Um, and it's not really two separate processes, it's the same levelling process, but I, I tend to think of it in two stages. So the first stage would be me uh, levelling out any individual frets, and I know there aren't any on here because there's no single notes that are sort of um, buzzing or failing, refusing to play. There are a couple that sound dead, as Bill pointed out, and so with the levelling we're hoping to just snip off the bits that are making those notes sound dead and then if there's any what I call fret slap which is the slightly accompanying z but you find that on it seems to go on large chunks of the neck it's not just in one place then that tends to be the fret slap caused by the ups and downs and in which case sort of a careful gentle leveling using the curvature of the tool mapping it directly straight down onto this fingerboard and using it very lightly tends to be the best way to um, just snip off all those peaks. And I guess the, the thing about um, any set of frets is you're sort of always working towards the lowest of them. It's like the literally the lowest common denominator. Now these, these bends are all good. Um, yeah, you know, you if you're going to take it to its extreme, you're going to let you're going to iron out all of the highs down to meet the lows, basically. But we don't go all the way with that because you don't need it absolutely dead flat in order to make the guitar play at the at the action we've chosen. So one and a half millimeters at the last fret, and one at the sorry one and a half millimeters last fret on the low string, and one point two on the high string is enough of an action to allow you to leave a fair bit of unevenness untouched under there. And that's that's a kind of that's a, a, a principle of just not taking any more metal than you need, which is why I like this method. One of the reasons why I like this method. There's no point uh, leveling these all of these frets to an absolute levelness if it if most of that is below the playing action we've set. So Actually, this is looking okay. It's, it's quite a high spot here, which is taking off um, a little bit. Okay. Good. Now, the next one. So each time I'm moving across, I'm recalibrating the tool so that its curve is as close as it can be. But as I said, it's an approximation of the neck curve because the neck actually goes up and down in a roller coaster. Um, exaggerating, but <laughs> so when do you think we're going to declare that that resin should be dry? I think I think it said. I think it said. Uh, um, uh, oh, well, it might sound here. The empty. Typical. Sets in five minutes. Really? Yeah. Mm. So I bet you, we, we will we get that out of the way? That one's coming out. Will this one come out? Some of that's come out. Yeah. Will this one come out? Some of it's come out. Well, it's pretty solid. We, we can worry about these leftover bits in a minute. Yeah. It's, you're right, it's, it's sticky on top. That yeah. If I scraped a little bit off, it, I think it will come off when it dries. And 
the next task will be to drill through there and get through the hole, which I'll do in a minute. <laughs> Dun, dun, dun. So I want to hear these notes play cleanly. Pretty good. I'm going to do a tiny bit more. There's a the low spot up there that we saw earlier on is causing a couple of just slightly struggly notes um, up right at the top here. So. I'm just levelling a bit more up here and pressing down on this end a bit because I just want to, inverted commas, focus on that end a tiny bit more. And experience tells me that's all I needed to do there. And the final calibration on this side. I've got the zoom at 8 o'clock. I've got tomorrow, we're hopefully... Where are we going tomorrow? Torquay. I'm going to take the kayak. Anywhere we don't have to carry a huge rucksack with a kayak in it. This is the secret. What's this? Were there's originals? Oh yeah. Supermarket sweets. Wow, that's good. I'm happy. All playing. Now, time to lose these old strings. Even though these are only a couple of weeks old, they sound very dead. Um, oh, Bill, you've done the cardinal wickedness. <laughs> you know what that is, don't you, Claire? Well, that too. She's learned. A knot. Yes, a knot. <laughs> not, you must not ever knot them. It brings blood to my eyes blood to my fingers that's for sure yeah so even um even though these strings are only a couple of weeks old apparently they are very dead so it'd be nice to put new ones on so we know we know that the um the nut works we know that there we've got rid of any possible humps and lumps enough that it's playing very well without any um what I call fret slap, and certainly no fret choking or buzz. And now we just need to reprofile these frets and then basically clean everything up before pre stringing with some good ow, stab. And at this point, I can take off the bridge and the uh, bits and bobs and give it a clean up, which I'll do with a cloth and with some um, naphtha, my favourite drink. <laughs> do you know something? I nearly did it. I nearly did the same again yesterday. I actually picked it up. I actually picked it up and had it in my hand. There's something Freudian, Freudian. I don't know. I don't know. But I was sort of surprised since I, I had a very unpleasant encounter with drinking a mouthful of it a few weeks ago. So, ta strings in. My yellow bottle. Well, yeah, but you know what happened to me the other day as well? As I had my yellow bottle on the side, I had this. <laughs> this is this is polished G10 polishing compound. Yeah. Not you wouldn't drink it. Not like the naphtha. 
Uh, just um, I might do. Yeah, the the the, the doctor was fairly unfrazed. Phased. He um, he just said, "Oh, drink some water. Sit here for a bit. Let sit here for a bit. Let me watch you. You know." Actually, he didn't watch me. He sat me outside the office just so that if I was going to die or vomit, I don't know, blood and guts, he, he could be there to book me in in a hurry. <laughs> right. So, obviously, the nut comes right off just now. We can leave that off. I'm going to take yonder tuners off as well because it's time this whole thing for the clean. And I think what I'll do is I will... Uh, yeah, we'll take the tuners off. I will show you the fret crowning and then I won't show you masking off the neck and polishing the neck, which is just a long, boring thing. And while I do that off the record, I will also progress the old lamp making thing a little bit. Uh, can I have my... Yes. Thank you. So this is... Um, this is a sort of. Oh, I can't see what I'm doing now. This is a bit of the, a bit of clean up and tweak going on here, just for. If I've got the guitar and it's, you know, it's tired and grubby, I do like to give it a, a clean. Um, because for a few, relatively few minutes of work, I think it's a nice touch. It also allows me to snoop around and make sure there's nothing else broken. And last guitar, a couple of guitars ago, I found uh, one of the tuners had a uh, the, the nylon washer had given up the ghost. So I was able to scavenge one from another set of spare tuners or an incomplete set of tuners. So I was able to put that right before it ever gave up on the customer so it was nice to be able to see those things ahead of time and taking a bit of time to clean the headstock is a good way to do it and for the sake of undoing a few things it's not a bad that's the right preventive maintenance so what i'll do is i'll paint up these frets again. Now this is going to be challenging because when the frets are low as these are, re-crowning them with a file is not the easiest thing to do um, because they're, they don't quite, well, they, yeah, the, the file works best at a certain minimum height and these are a bit either at that or below it slightly. So, so I will use the medium sized medium side of this. And the idea is we run it across and do our best to round off any sharp edges caused by the leveling. And uh, I can see straight away that it's there's not really enough material to, to make a great success of reshaping this. Sort of working it's in inevitable at this age of fret life. Um, there's a sort of another low tech way of doing it, which might just, I don't know, take about four times longer. Actually, it's, it's working just about okay, but it, it's a marginal. That's what you get with olden frets. So what's the next thing we've got to do on the lamp, Claire? Uh, oh, drill. Drill, drill, drill. Because that hole at the top sort of wanders off sideways straight away, doesn't it? A bit to go and get to exit as it does down at the back side of the... It's, it's the way I went through fine. Yeah. Okay. 
My only concern would be in drilling it now. If there's any sort of sticky goo that collects there, we won't get the thing through. But it'll it'll either work or it won't. In which case, we might have to pull it all apart and do it with a putty instead. And poor old Harry won't get it for his birthday after all. So, sticky. Mm. I mean, five minutes it says. So, I mean, it, you often find the sticky where incompletely mixed stuff goes but because it's like sometimes it's a blob of one half of it without the hardener or the hardener without the other stuff okay not bad so once I've just recrowned these frets what I'm going to do is mask off the fretboard with masking tape and then I will polish the frets out or sand them out and polish them out so that means going through a whole series of papers um, I go from this this here this tool here has got a grit of effectively 150 so I go 240 400 600 uh, 1000 1500 and then I go to a set of micro mesh papers which goes from 1500 all the way up to 12,000 in a series of nine steps. So it's very fine polishing by the time you get to the 12,000, and that gives you a, a nice smooth fret to play on. So that should all be very nice. Okay, so there's the, the re crowning part done. Um, I'm gonna Put it on hold for now while I go and do that bit but I'll come back when it's all clean and it's time to restring it. See you in a minute. Okay so we've done the uh, everything, fret, sanding, polishing out, clean the headstock, put the tuners back on, the crossbow cover on, put oil on the fingerboard there and now we're going to put on new strings and the secret of the new strings, I'm going to show you how I do it Bill. Um, but it seems to work really well, so I just offer it as a, a alternative. But it doesn't doesn't involve any. You don't need any things locking the strings. It doesn't. All good luthiers will agree that it doesn't add anything to it. Now, when you come to restring with the adjustable tusk nut, um, my recommendation is you string. Why have they put these? They interlock these. Um, put the middle two strings on first. So we start. I will start with the D and the G. Oh, well, first of all, it will help that I put back on the, these bits. You can't see this, but I'm putting on the stop bar posts, the stop bar, and the bridge. <coughs> so I forgot about those bits. They're not important. Now the good thing about this is I can set the action back to where I want it, so even if it's not there to begin with, I don't have to worry, I can just put all the bits on for now and we'll, we'll make the adjustments shortly. That's another one of the reasons I don't much like these bridges, is that yours is very, very stiff and uh, that's not a good thing. Right, so we're going to start with the wound D keep the stop bar on. So we come up to the top here and how I do it is I make sure all my things are lined up, all the holes are lined up ready to go, just makes it easier. Stops me fiddling about. You get the D and this is the way I would uh, do it. I do do it. So D on all the way through, pull it taut, drop it in its slot make sure it's over the saddle and then I pull back one fret's worth like so, hold it there and I start turning and I hold the held string tight, keep it under pressure 
guide it over the loose string which goes at the bottom and then as it comes round, I keep keeping the held string taut, I pull up the loose string and then I guide the held string under that and pull up. And those two wraps together locks it off nicely and you don't need any more or less than that. Now I'm just noticing straight away I can go down the other end and adjust dial up the bridge because it's currently too low. I can see that with my bare eyeballs. So it's quite a bit of raising to do here. Um, do some more in a minute. Okay, so that's the D. Now that, that doing that first holds the, the nut down in the middle. Technically that insert at the top of the nut is loose, so it could come out I'll just drop back in if it does and there's a little piece of brass that goes with it but very simple to put back in but putting the these middle strings on first pull it back one fret hold it there with my thumb this time because it's a different side and it has to work differently again i hold the held string so it, the loose one goes under keeping it taut i guide it round under the loose string this time and then let it Kind of lock itself off there and then cut off the excess. So those two middle strings now have the nut insert tied down nicely. There's no way it's going to go anywhere and you can then concentrate on the others. So I'll go to the E and the A or the A and the E I should say. No way. And then the secret after that, as I mentioned at the beginning, now we've got the nut made of the right material, permanently lubricated tusk with its PTFE. Now, what we have to really concentrate on once I've fitted these strings is stretching them out, which I'll show you again in a minute. Um, same applies here. It's one fret's worth of wire that goes extra onto the coil, and that's little enough so you don't store a load of um, slack in there and it's enough to hold the strings they never come undone there's no chance of them slipping strings just don't do it and it's a it's a funny thing that people talk about um, buying new tuners when you know you see in forums people say they've got terrible tuning stability and all the best advice people get is that tells them to buy, go and buy some expensive tuners. There's every good reason for buying expensive tuners, um, and that the reasons are that they look great, they operate more smoothly, they're very precise, and the gearing's good, and so on. And it makes the experience of tuning better, but they do not have any impact on your tuning stability of your guitar. That comes down completely to the string uh, slack, and the nut slots that I've mentioned. So if you get those two things right, you can have the cheapest tuners, most basic tuners that you get with, you know, Squire, Strats, and even older and more, you know, ropey sort of guitars than that, and they will still stay and play in tune as long as you get the nut right and the slack removed. And it takes a lot more to remove the slack than you'd think. Um, I regularly get people say, well, I, don't you just tune it up a tone and, and leave it overnight and under tension, it will all be all right, type of thing. And it's, it, the answer is no, you physically have to pull this slack out. Because if you don't, then your playing technique will, and it will, the amount of slack that's in there will come out, the tiniest amount will come out every time you play or bend a note, but it, takes the minutest amount to put your guitar out of tune. And if you couple that with a nut that um, has a has kind of friction on the slots holding the strings, stopping them from moving freely, and then you build up different tensions on each side of the string and so forth, those things, that alone can make your guitar go out of tune every time you try and play it. Um, just that tiny little pressure or tension differential amazing how much can contribute to it going out of tune. But none of it is the tuners. Right, so once I've put the strings on, first thing I do is give them a, a kind of pull 
to bed them in. But this is a set of nine, so I've got to be careful that I don't pull them so hard that they break. Um, so just really getting them seated to begin with. And then I will take a reference note. A charger. For the iPhone. For the what? iPhone. Yeah, this one here. Uh, this one here, if you're running low. Sorry. Um, right, so that's the first kind of quick tune up. Then what I do is I physically grab the strings and push and pull them between thumb and forefinger. And I can do this four or so times. What time have you got there, Claire? Um, Right, quarter to eight. Now I have to check and see if we've got the zoom call at half eight, like I requested. We might just make it because we've got the stretching to do and then we've also got the intonating to do. So what I'm doing anyway is I'm going up and down all the strings, stretching it, and what you'll get from that is you'll get a tune, as you expect. That's the first bit of slack being moved. So really what you're looking to do is to do it until there's no more detuning. And what you'll notice is the amount of detuning changes each time, uh, or as you, each time you do it, there'll be less. Now just while I'm at it, I'm just gonna, before I go any further, I'm just gonna double check the action and get that just right. And then we don't have to play with that any further. So this was pretty low to begin with. That was good. Mm -hmm. Too high on that side. Nice and low. So again, we'll tune it to pitch. And then we put it back and we do it again. And you'll find that the um, wound strings will hold the slack longer than the, the uh, plain ones, which will stabilize much quicker. But knowing that, you sort of give the wound ones a little bit more attention. Um, I said before in many a video, there is a plastic string stretcher device you can buy, but I found that was lacking tactile feedback, so I broke more strings. A little, see how small adjustment. Okay, that's the tuning pretty much stable. Next bit I'm going to do. Are you playing a little game? I am. I'm not bored. No, I'm playing. I know. We're out of here in a minute. Just tired. So I will just get the intonation checked. Now, intonation, Bill, to let you know, is subjective and it obviously has most to do with how hard you fret a note. So my um, my intonation may be different from yours, but I aim for an average. Set pretty well. Well, pretty well set, and it concurs with my strength of fretting. Mm-hmm. Bit 
short that one the A. It's boring somebody. Finished up, dashing out the door now to go to a, a Zoom meeting. But thank you so much for sending the guitar, and um, uh, hopefully we'll get it in the post. Look, can you come and see Ron? He yeah, needs your yeah. help walking. <laughs> yeah, he's he's not doing too bad actually. He's been he's been he he kind of became very immobile for a while, um, but he's now sort of quite proudly telling me he's doing. A good walk up from outside the house back in using the kind of rails and the concrete lost a slope. Weight as well, yeah, he lost some weight in the uh, the um, respite place. Yeah. Anyway, that's me done. Let's get out of here. Thanks for um, sending the guitar. Take care. Ho hope you like it. By the way, I've set it at the lowest possible action. You can, of course, if it's too low, you can raise it up a tiny bit just by dialing these um, counterclockwise. But I've set it at its lowest. Okay.